sit down, shut up, put a cut on your mouth, put it in your ears. You should not dictate the course of your treatment. Uh, treating people like they're worthless. Uh, it's, that's part of the reason why right now recovery rates linger around 10%. Uh, it's not working. Uh, so the philosophy that I go by, uh, many of them in the country do, my mentors is harm reduction. Um, people are here, destroying themselves, um, jabbing ourselves with a needle 10 times a day. And in a 28 day treatment setting, you expect them to get you complete abstinence. We've completely changed people, places, and things. You're going to 90 meetings in 90 days. <laughs> It works if you work it, but there's no such thing as willpower at the same time. And I, I, I rip on everything, um, if you ever talk to me. Because uh, there's, there's, I mean, I, and I got sober in a 12 step fellowship. I still go to a 12 step fellowship, but there's holes. Not just in that, but there's holes with MAT. There's holes everywhere. So I'm going to expose them. Because um, I, like, one of my heroes is Christopher Hitchens. Uh, there's a writer that died many, many years ago. But I mean, the man attacked Mother Teresa and Gandhi. I respect that, because nobody's perfect. So we need to expose all the things that are wrong. If we don't, and we act like we're in cloud nine, like, oh no, this is perfect, no it's not. Let's talk about what's wrong so we can fix it. Okay, so we have to talk about what's wrong with treatment modalities so we can fix it. We have to talk about what's wrong that, you know, for since 1935, this was it. You know, we know better today. We know there are other things that work better. We know that not everyone is going to fit into that little niche. And there has no options available. That's why it's great that refuge recovery is available now. That's why it's great that there's smart recovery. There's other options available. We don't have to tell people, well, you obviously didn't want them bad enough while we're standing over their grave. I did. You know, um, many times. Um, so that's why we're here. I have to talk about that and talk about our induction. So we can't go from here to here. Some can. Okay, when we're, we're talking about a drug that can kill you, with one use, one time. At my center, when an alcoholic walks in, I breathe a sigh of relief. I know I have a little more time. I can make some suggestions. Uh, we can try this. With, when somebody comes in that's opiate dependent, we make one bad suggestion, one bad call. We don't properly educate them, make them really do a good clinical and make the best treatment recommendation, that person could die. Um, so there's a, there's a lot on the line here. And I've personally helped over a thousand people and I lost three. Now I carry those three with me, but the national average is one in 30. So I'm at three in a thousand. So, and that's based on this philosophy. So it's working. But we also push things like needle change programs, which I get a lot of slack for from people. Um, just to go back, some people will be with me, others will look a little, look a little bit younger. There's a lot of comparables from the HIV epidemic in the 80s, late 80s, to the heroin epidemic now. So many comparables, the whole, oh, it's a choice. Oh, you chose to have sex with that person, so you chose to get this disease. Oh, it's just gay people that are dying, who cares? Uh, you can get AIDS sitting on a toilet, treating this fear. We have that same thing when they're talking about this fentanyl drug which is an opioid, that they're telling people you can overdose or touching it, which is medically possible. And yet, that's on the news. Just like in the late 80s, they were telling you these things like you get AIDS and sitting on a toilet. So, I mean, so the comparable is that in two things, two things stopped oh, and slowed down the AIDS epidemic. Harm reduction and medication. All right? And did everybody put a seatbelt down today when they got in the car? If you did raise your hand. Congratulations, you all practice harm reduction today. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, mis, you know, a lot of misconceptions about it, like we're enabling drug use. <clears throat> so the three things that harm reduction really falls around that we work on is Narcan, which is the drug that reverses overdoses, needle exchange programs because they reduce the transmission of hepatitis C, HIV, and they prevent bacterial infections from using dirty needles, which there's a whole wing of barns right now for endocarditis kids are dying for using dirty needles. And then something else to talk about, which is called CUES, Comprehensive User Engagement Sites. You may have heard them before referred to as safe injection facilities or safe consumption facilities, where there's a place where there's trained nurses there who can administer Narcan. 
There's a Jordan Opera concert there, but the people go there to use. There's 103 of these sites around the world. It's never been a death. Like needle exchange programs, people that use programs like this are five times more likely to enter treatment. Because we get, we get them before they're ready for help. It's called early engagement. So somebody walks into my office this morning. All they wanted was a clean needle. That's all they care about. They got food, compassion, conversation, and they found out about treatment resources, treatment resources that they did not know even existed. So about 80% of the people that use our program, within three months, we put in treatment. So the effect of that program is the complete opposite of enabling. Same thing with, say, consumption sites, which we call cues now. There is, there's consequences that propel us to find recovery, that send me to treatment six times, that finally told me, hey, this is enough. Those three things, naloxone, clean needles, and cues, do not remove any of the consequences that force somebody to go to treatment. They don't remove the pain, they don't remove the hopelessness, they don't remove the homelessness. What they do is they prevent death and disease. So that is the direction that we need to take. There's one open in Philadelphia, my buddy's doing it, another one in San Francisco. Um, I have a legis piece of legislation in the state right now for it, which will go nowhere at all. Um, and then we're working um, with the board of aldermen in St. Louis City uh, for one there. Uh, so that's where we're at, but this is, a, this is a necessary change. The way we look at this, the way we look at addiction, and where we're going to go in the future, but this is no fix. This is a fix to save some lives. But we still have to go back to what I started talking about. Every drug use, heroin, meth, everything is on the rise. So how do we, we can save lives, we can engage people in early treatment, but how do we go back here? You know, we could, like I said, we could falsify all day about why people can't <laughs> accept life, you know, anymore. And have to go to the body. I have, you know, my interpretations about the, the destruction of the middle class and the field of hopelessness, but that's just my own uh, personal takes on these things. But there's more to it, and it's not just the big, bad, evil pharmaceutical companies, okay? They did a lot of shady things in the 90s, and they pushed pain meds like it was the cure, all, all cure, but it's not Purdue Pharmaceuticals' fault that I love heroin. And another pharmaceutical company did, you know, cure polio. So let's we have to take a go with the bad. There's always going to be that evil uh, capitalist entity that's going to be pushing profit over people. There's going to be for-profit prisons that don't offer treatment because there's no profit when somebody finds a car and doesn't end up back in the system. We're going to be mad on this. They're never going anywhere. What's our role? What can we pass on to the next generation? So maybe they don't eat Tide Pods and shoot a lot of heroin. Um, but that's what I'm asking you guys. Um, my only idea, and the only thing that I'm doing today, is empathy. Um, we do some school presentations at high schools, and that's the message we're trying to send. You know, um, social media has birthed, and I think it was inside these people already, but these keyboard cowards that feel like they can just say anything. Painful, hurtful. Maybe it's some cathartic experience for them because they're just miserable human beings, but they portray such hate and intolerance and ignorance that we have to battle that. And the perfect ones to battle that are the kids who are raising now. You know, to teach them, no, this is not a choice. Nobody chooses to destroy themselves. Uh, no more lying. No more, oh, if you do heroin one time, you're going to be addicted like they did to me in the 80s with crack when Derek came into my program. You know what I did when they told me that? I ran out and smoked crack to prove they were wrong. <laughs> so my message is empathy. Stop lying to children. Be data-driven and push for compassionate solutions that they do not enable, and you know what, if they do, so what? You know, um, when I be with families, you know, in one instance, enabling could kill somebody, but in that next instance, it could save their life. So 
So that's something we all have to grasp that this isn't just this one size fits all thing to this problem. And it goes way beyond, you know, like I said, just opiates. Uh, there's more going on here that we need to address. But in the meantime, we need help. You know, I still, um, the needle exchange bill, I got it out of the House of Representatives. It came out with only 13 no votes. If anybody lives in House Springs, Missouri, your rep is Representative Shane Roden, and he is an evil, evil little man. <laughs> He voted no on first responder Narcan. He, he voted no on everything. And he stood up on the House floor during the vote on the Neil Shades bill and tried to give an impassioned speech against it, but he's a fool, so he made no sense. But if you live in House Springs, Missouri, <laughs> get out next November and vote against this man. <laughs> and I remember when we were passing the 9-11 Good Samaritan law, so people could call without fear of arrest, he got up and he He's, he spoke on my brothers and sisters, and he said, dopers won't call for help because dopers don't care about anybody but themselves. That's the biggest lawyer. Sorry, no, um, I've ever heard in my life. But that's the mentality that we need to change. Okay? Um, so I wish I had some like, wonderful news. Like, yes, um, um, we have a lot of free treatment now. I will leave you with some good news, okay? Uh, we got $10 million from the feds. Uh, right now, throughout the whole state, we have free methadone, mm -hmm. free suboxone, and free Revitrol for anybody that needs it. Okay, this is for the underinsured or the uninsured. Uh, if you have insurance, and the, the, usually there's a problem, so this is for the ones that don't. That same money is now is paying for sober living now. There's a bunch of homes now where if you're struggling just to get on your feet and need to get disabled housing before you can really start working so you don't walk into a place that Need $400 for you to move in when you're fresh out of rehab. There's help out there now for that too. All right, and we're in um, year, we're in month 11 of two year grant, so we still got a year left of this money. So please take advantage of it if you know anybody struggling. And based on the reason and where we're at, I really don't think I have to give my don't shame people on medication speech, um, but I will. <laughs> Um, addiction is very, very similar to type 2 diabetes. Very similar. Uh, some people can make lifestyle changes to keep their blood sugar under control. Others can't. Those that can't need medication. All right. Some people struggling with substance use disorder are going to need medication. It may be for a few months, maybe for a few years, it may be a lifetime. That's their journey, not ours. Okay. But I, there's a lot of shaming on medication. Um, again, another social media thing, that one meme that shows a forest says this is an antidepressant. And it shows a pill that says this is a lifelong addiction. If you really have an SSRI deficiency in your brain, eating a tree is not going to do anything. Some people will need this help. You don't need a tree, you go and sit in nature and <laughs> care of it. But I'm just, it's like, I'm sick of seeing people get like beat down. We're already beat down enough when we finally get into recovery. Um, battered, did some things that we won't be able to face or talk about for a very long time. And the people that we're supposed to turn to, other people in recovery and say, help me, the last thing they should do is look at them and be like, I think you're not clean. You're on the suboxone. Like, seriously? We are supposed to live by spiritual principles. Honesty, open mindedness, willingness, humbleness, love. That is the exact opposite of how you feel to live in recovery. It happens all the time. I see it, it makes me sick in my stomach. Mm -hmm. um, but please, uh, we have a Facebook page, Missouri Network for OB Reform and Recovery. As soon as I'm off paternity leave, which is almost take like four days off, <laughs> I'll be back in Jeff City. Um, we'll need people to call their senators to push for the new exchange bill. Uh, we do a lot of work. Uh, I have a, we have a recovery community center. Uh, we do have CHIV testing. We have refuge recovery. We have yoga. We have free kung fu and tai chi. Um, it's just a walk and open, you know, every day, 10 to 5, if you need anything. Yoga, needles. I mean, if you're diabetic, I got a whole shipment in of these really short needles I can't get to users. So if you know what this diabetic, send them so they can take these needles because I had nothing to do with them so I want to give them to people with diabetes. 
All right, so um, Jeff's here. He's with my kid. Um, but he is one of our male peers, because um, we're a peer run center. Uh, so any questions you want to engage and talk to him, we'd love to have more people come by.